Hi, this is Imre Galambos, professor of Chinese at Cambridge University. This video is about the use of classical Chinese in modern society. Although it is supposedly a dead language, and it is quite different from spoken Mandarin, we can encounter it in many places in our modern world. We can even say that it's all around us. So where is it, and how is it possible? So if you're interested in this, please stick around. Oh, and please remember to subscribe and like this video. Thank you. What we call classical Chinese is, in a sense, the ancestor of modern forms of Chinese, including the official language known as Mandarin, but also the many dialects throughout China, such as Cantonese, Minnanese, Shanghainese, or Hakka. In a way, this is kind of similar to how Latin is considered the ancestor of modern Romance languages, including French, Italian, or Spanish, or how ancient Greek is the ancestor of modern Greek. This is, of course, an oversimplification, because languages, or dialects, do not develop on their own, but are also influenced by other languages around them. We should also know that classical Chinese was used for centuries as the written language alongside spoken varieties of Chinese. So the history of modern Chinese and its various dialects, including the official Mandarin, is not a straightforward from point A to point B kind of development. The important thing, however, is that classical Chinese was used as the written language of China for more than 2,500 years. It was the language of administration, of literature, religion, and was used in any context where texts are normally used. This is also why in English it is sometimes called literary Chinese, which is a term that aims to eliminate some of the problems with calling it classical. So this language was the official form of writing in China until about a century ago. It was the language most Chinese texts were written in, including the Confucian classics, the philosophical literature of the Warring States period, classical poetry and the great essays of prose writers, the legal codes, administrative documents, official histories, pretty much anything that mattered. And this remained the case even when this was no longer the language people spoke in their daily life. So for most of its history, paradoxically, it was a dead language in everyday use, that is, written use. It was only in the first decades of the 20th century that leading intellectuals in China began to advocate the use of vernacular Chinese in writing, that is, of the modern language. And they did this to promote education and literacy. The ultimate aim of this movement was economic and societal advancement, and progress in general. And it was largely inspired by the example of Western powers in Japan. This vernacularization movement was a success. And in the course of several decades, vernacular Chinese became the official written language. Today, almost anything that is written is written in this language, which in theory is quite similar to spoken Chinese. As expected, classical Chinese took a big hit and retreated from the prominent position it had once occupied, although it is still taught at schools and universities. And as a result of this momentous change, now we have a divide between China's past, which is written in a language people no longer actively use, and China's present, which is written in modern Chinese. However, despite all of these developments, classical Chinese did not disappear altogether. It survives in a variety of contexts and is being used even today. And here I will raise only three examples of the contexts in which this ostensibly dead language still persists. Number one is idioms. One of the most obvious contexts is the mind-boggling array of four-character idioms used in both writing and speech. In Chinese, these are called Chengyu, or form sayings. They can be direct quotations from ancient texts, some of them going back 2,500 years, while others are just concise and witty sayings emulating the language of those ancient texts. There are literally thousands of such idioms, and they are greatly appreciated by everyone. They are powerful expressions that can really drive home the meaning in a way that would be impossible for ordinary words. Often their power comes from precision, from how fitting they are within a specific context. In this, they are quite similar to proverbs and sayings in other languages. In many cases, the differences with the modern language in grammar and the meaning of words are a device that alerts the reader or the listener that these four characters or syllables are not part of continuous speech, but should be treated as a standalone unit. For example, the expression xiang qu shen yuan means very different or very distant. Literally, it means they are very distant from each other. And it is an expression that already occurs in the Lunhang, a collection of essays written in the first century AD, although it's possible that it was in use before that too. What is interesting here in this idiom is that its grammar is different from modern Chinese, and so is the meaning of the words qu and shen. 
they reflect the conventions of classical Chinese. The phrase is common in modern writing and speech, but it is conceived as a single unit with a specific meaning. The four-character structure was a common syntactical unit in classical Chinese, which is why most of these idioms consist of four characters. The second context I want to talk about is signs. Public signs and warnings are another context where we commonly see expressions written in classical Chinese. And it's actually quite fitting that these signs are always written. As it was the case with the idioms, these signs normally consist of four characters, or multiples of four characters. And we should note that not all signs are in classical Chinese, but many are. For example, the sign that says, Feiqing Wu Ru, no admittance, has a distinctly classical grammar. It literally means, if you're not invited, do not enter. Interestingly, this is not a quote from an ancient text. It is probably a modern construct that uses classical language to generate a sign that stands out from the environment and has some sort of authority and expressiveness. Writing the same thing in modern Chinese is definitely less expressive and somehow has less weight. The third category I want to talk about is titles. Titles are yet another area where the concise and expressive nature of classical Chinese is utilized with enthusiasm. These can be titles of books, movies, video games, events, or pretty much anything. Again, the four-character rule applies, although there are also signs that are shorter or longer, and there are many which are written in the modern language. But somehow there is a preference for writing titles that conform to the conventions of classical Chinese. For example, the original Chinese title of the movie Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon is Wo Hu Cang Long, in which both phrases are well-known classical idioms. They have been in use for 2,000 years. The Chinese title of the movie Farewell, My Concubine is Ba Wang Pie Ji, in which the word Pie is used in the classical sense of saying goodbye, which is not its meaning in modern Chinese. Even more interesting is to see translations of foreign titles. For example, the Chinese versions of movies such as Die Hard or Inception and many others all have titles that conform to the rules of classical Chinese. Here it is clear that the use of this language is not the result of operating within a traditional theme such as martial arts, but is an intentional way of creating a title that stands out with its precision, brevity and expressive power. Besides these three contexts we just examined, there are a number of others where classical Chinese is used. Many of these contexts have some sort of connection with the past, but there are also other areas in which this type of language is used intentionally to set it apart from spoken language as something more elevated, authoritative, or expressive. So in a sense, this dead language continues to live on and is part of the extremely complex phenomenon of language today. Okay, that's what I wanted to say about the use of classical Chinese in modern China today. Hope it was useful. Let me know if you have any questions or there are related topics you want me to talk about. Thank you for watching and see you next time.